it was shut. We're going to look at a parable in Matthew. If you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 25. Beginning with verse 1, it's the parable of the ten virgins. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Verse 1. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. So all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. And the door was shut. And the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Verse 10, and the door was shut. Verse 13, watch therefore, for you do not know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. This is a parable or a story about ten people, ten women, ten virgins. They were waiting for the bridegroom. Five are prepared for the bridegroom to come with their lamps and their oil. And enough in case the bridegroom doesn't come on time, which is not very uncommon back in the culture of that day. It was not a Brazil as well. Sometimes you'll have an hour later. Wedding day starts at 9, 9, 30. Not uncommon at all. In fact, very common. Five are prepared. Five are not prepared. They come with their lamps, but not with their oil. And when the bridegroom comes, no oil. But the bridegroom delays his coming and so the five who can't borrow oil go off to purchase oil. And while they're gone, the bridegroom came. And those who had oil in the lamps trimmed went into the way. And those who were not, no doubt, cried and hollered and maybe beat with their fists on the door. And their hands maybe became bloody. And it's submersible, it was a nanosecond that happened before they had opportunity to even think one at the death of the Lord. But the door, the door was shut. They pound on the door, I want out.
Verse 13, watch therefore. Jesus says, for you do not know the day or the hour when the Son of Man is coming. What is the application to our lives? The first application is that it is very possible to be ready for the Son of Man to come. It is possible. It is possible. But it is equally possible to not be ready for the Son of Man, the bridegroom, to come. And when Jesus one day comes back and he separates and ushers us to the right and to the left, it is possible to hear, come you into the place blessed by the Father and prepared since the foundation of the world. But it is also possible, equally possible, for an individual that's ushered off to the left side of our Lord, even though we or they cry out to the Lord and scream, it is possible to hear. People crying out, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name, Lord? Very possible. Jesus says it is. And we will hear if we are not prepared, if we are lost, as lost as those five men in the submersible were lost at sea, no one knew who they were. They had no more opportunities to give up times or to change their life, not even a nanosecond to ask a prayer, not even a prayer. They didn't know they were lost, as bad as they were. We will hear, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And we will hear the slamming or the shutting of the door, and the door will be shut and locked. And the question for us today is, are you ready for the door to be shut? Very quickly, I want to mention three examples from the book of Acts. Things that you and I need to consider and be reminded of. That we are not ready for the door to be shut. And there's only really one point today. If we are lost. I'm going to say it again. You and I are not ready for the door to be shut if we are lost. If you would, turn over to Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, the whole chapter basically says that there's not a righteous person on earth that does good and sins not. It doesn't matter how righteous and how good. In Romans chapter 3 and 23, it's a very short, short little verse. Jesus, God, the Spirit says, For all of us, all of the world, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm painfully aware of how short that I come to the glory of God. And I really pray that today you are. In 1 John chapter 5, the chapter basically says that the whole world is under sin. The whole world is basically lost. In a lost condition. That mankind is lost. We need a Savior. 
We need salvation. The greatest question ever asked could be, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Lord, what must I do to be saved? If those guys that had five minutes and knew they would die by implosion in five minutes, I always believe with all of my heart that they probably would have had a desire to pray or to raise their voice to whoever, all or whoever, and ask for penitence and forgiveness and safety. Sir, what must I do to be saved? Lord, I'm lost. I'm lost. When you answer that question, when you turn to the Bible, if I learn the words of Jesus and hear those words today, and do nothing about it, if I'm in a lost condition and I hear God's words today and do nothing about it, the door will be shut and you will die in your sins. And so we're going to ask, answer the question and ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Please turn to Acts chapter 16. Three quick examples. In Acts chapter 16, there's an individual in Philippi, a jailer, that puts Paul and Silas into a prison. The doors are shut and locked. And Paul and Silas, I can imagine myself, what would I do? What would we be doing in there? Lord, why am I here? Lord, what did you do to me? Am I going to die in the prison? All of the things that we would begin to ask ourselves in periods of, of frailty and weakness. And I want out and I'm hungry and I'm sick and I'm tired and I'm wet. And there's rats here. And spiders and infestation in the dungeons and jails of ancient worlds and the Roman Empire. Do what Paul and Silas were doing, right? They were singing. They were singing to the Lord. They were praising God. An earthquake came, earthquake came and, and the shackles were broken, and the jailer knew that if the prisoners were released, he would die. And Paul says, Sirs, don't harm yourself. We're all here. We're not, we're not running away. You underline in your with your finger. If you don't have a pen, in verse 30 of 16, read it with me. And he brought them out, that's the jailer, and said, Sirs, not prisoners, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? In the verses following, he was told to believe on the Lord with all of your house, and you shall be saved. He wasn't told all you have to do is believe. He wasn't told, just believe. He was told to believe. The word believe in the Bible has three aspects. The first aspect is to accept. Accept what God says. Did you accept what God said today? Or are you? Accept it. Not hard to do. The second aspect is to trust what God says. Trust it. And the third aspect of the definition of belief is to act on God's teachings. 
Someone said the faith that saves is the faith that obeys. The faith that saves means the faith that obeys. You must accept and you must trust what you have to act on that belief. And if I keep that in mind, I will understand that I will act on my trust and belief. And then in verse 32 and 33 it says, they spoke the word of the Lord. They didn't just stop there. They continued teaching and speaking the word of the Lord. Verse 32, read it there. And to all who were in his house, the jailer. You know what he did? He was saved, right? He was told to believe. Saved, right? Verse 33. They immediately took him the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately, he and his family, immediately, not a day later, not a week later, not on a baptism Sunday, in the future, immediately they were baptized. He and his whole household. The Bible says they rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. They believed because they accepted, they trusted, and they acted on their belief. The second example, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, you have thousands of people that are religious. The Bible says, devout Israelites from all nations. Deeply spiritual people. That's why that they were in Jerusalem on this special day of Pentecost. And Peter says when he speaks to them, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 22. Hear these words. Men of Israel. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and you have crucified him and you have put him to death. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Peter did what? Peter confirmed, this is the one. This is the only one, the Messiah, you've been looking for for thousands of years that was prophesied in the Old Testament. You have crucified him. And he has been resurrected by God. And he has been exalted to the right hand of God. And so therefore, the conclusion is, let all of Israel, let all of the world today, let all of the ones here and here know that God has made Jesus Lord and Christ. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How can we be saved? Verse 38 he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Not as a group, but every one of you. Not later, but now. Every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins because you are in sin. You are lost. You have crucified Christ. You are part of the crowd that did that. Repent. And be baptized every single one of you and do it now if you want to be saved. They said, verse 37, then in red, what shall we do? Peter said, repent, that everyone be baptized. The third example, if you'll turn over to Acts chapter 9. We're still talking about it. The door is shut and lost. 
If I'm lost, the door is shut. And only you can open it. And only for a certain time. In Acts chapter 9, Paul, on his road to Damascus, he is, someone said, the Gestapo that rounds up Christians and delivers them to Rome and other places to be tortured and, and murdered. And his mission is to arrest them. And on that road, the Lord appears in a light. And, and he falls down and says, who are you? The Lord says, I am Jesus whom you persecute. And you know what Paul said, Saul? What would you have me to do? I think he was terrified. A strong, educated, religious, devout man. What would you have me to do, Lord? The Lord says, go into the city and he told you what you must do. He does that. The Bible says for three days he didn't eat nor drink. He fasted. That shows his godly sorrow, wondering, what did I do? What, how did I mess up? I want to fix it. I want to fix it now as quick as I can. I'm lost and I don't know what to do. Lord talked to Ananias and he went to the house and ambushed him. Saul went there. You know, the interesting thing about Ananias, I love him. When he was told what to do, you know what he said? Here I am, Lord. Oh, that's a wonderful statement in the Bible. It really is. If you look back at history, you know it's Isaiah. We just saw that vision in Isaiah. Here I am, Lord. Don't send anyone else. Send me. Let me do it. I'm a man of unclean lips and unholy, but Lord, send me. Equip me. When Mary was told that she would be a, a virgin, I love Mary. Think about that. You being Mary. You know what she said when the court came? She says, here I am. Use me, Lord. Unlike Moses and others that kind of ran and jumped at us, but there are so many figures in the Bible and probably those that we don't know. Here I am. Oh, Lord, tell us. Here I am. Tell us what to do. And Paul saw he was one of those. Here I am. What do you want me to do, Lord? The Bible says in verse 17, after he was told what to do, to go into the city. Ananias, verse 17, says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you, have, as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight. Oh, thank God. I got my sight back. They're going to. I mean, filled with the Holy Spirit. I thought I already had the Holy Spirit. No, Paul, you're lost. Verse 18, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose, and he was baptized. He was baptized. He got some food, and he was strengthened. Why wait? You should. If the door has been shut, you are lost. In Acts chapter 16, there's a jailer that was told to believe on the Lord and you'll be saved. In Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, there was a group of thousands that were told to repent and be baptized to be saved. There's Saul here in Acts 9 who was told to arise and go and be baptized. And they all immediately did that very thing. And the question comes religiously at me from every corner. Why three different answers to the question? Have you ever been on a trip? Yesterday I was in at 11.08. After I filled up my car on the corner in 
down on sea beach. I was hundreds of miles from home. GPS said eight and a half hours. As I was driving and got to Columbus, I asked the GPS how far I am. Am I in the GPS? Said or showed me I was still hundreds of miles, but a lot closer. When I got to Tupelo, I asked again. I was still a distance, but I got a different answer of how far and how much time it would be to life. Same question. How far am I from my home? 58 saddle feet right in the At least three different answers. Why? I was in different places when I asked that question. When the jailer was told to believe on the Lord and you will be saved, he he, he didn't have that belief. He was to believe. But he still had good ties to be saved. He was lost. In Acts chapter 2, the ones that heard believed to a point, but believed more, and they were told to be ties. They were at a different point in their religious devout seeking of the Messiah. And then you have Saul, a faithful devout Jew, who in Acts chapter 9, Thought he was doing everything right. He was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. And he was told to rise and be baptized. Why did they receive three different answers? Are there three different ways you just believe and leave the rest off? They were at different points in their conversion to the Lord. That's the difference. And that's the only difference. The jailer needed to believe and accept Jesus. The Jews on Pentecost were already looking for the Messiah. Peter said, here he is. This is him. Saul was on the road to Damascus. He was in a different place in his life. What do you want me to do? The attitude of a sinner should be, what do you want me to do? Arise their times. Call them the Lord. Believe in Him. But as I conclude, there's coming a day when the door will be shut. What side of the door will you be on? Those men in that submersible didn't have a chance. Jesus says, I am at the door and knocking, and he's knocking today. You're lost. If you're on the wrong side of the door and the door is shut. And the door is shut today, now, this minute. If you're not ready for God. If you're not ready to give your life how you think and how you live to God. The door is shut. If you have not been baptized by today, by this minute, by this second, the door is shut. We still have time. They didn't have even a minute of a second. I understand they imploded, were obliterated. There is nothing left. Except there's something.
soul. Which in a nanosecond went to meet God. Are you ready for that door to be shut? 